Calvin, welcome to the Land Podcast. So excited to have you on here this morning. Thank you for having me on, Jake. Appreciate it. Yeah, we've uh, we've been going back and forth here. I think you messaged originally probably like right before deer season, and then that's kind of a crazy time and things get lost in the shuffle. And and uh, we've been talking here briefly, and, and you sent over some things you've done in the past year, and I'm, I'm excited to dive into all of that. But I'll give you the honor of introducing yourself to, to all the listeners. Cool, yeah. I'm excited too. I mean, I think land and slash whitetails is probably my favorite thing to talk about. So I'm um, I'm full-time in real estate. For the last probably seven years, um, not as an agent, just as a investor, flip homes, own apartment buildings, own commercial, um, and own land, and um, kind of started out in the hunting. Started out, graduated high school in two thousand nine. Started out with buying a rental. Grand Rapids in West Michigan was very, I'll say, very depressed in at, at that time in terms of the real estate market, and um, so you know, by accident, it was kind of a good time to start. Although I didn't, you know, I made all the wrong, wrong decisions and wrong moves and learned, learned through those, uh, through those hard times. So kind of had a small marketing firm, largely within the hunting industry, uh, worked for, for Thero for a couple of years. And then I think it was 2016 or 2017 that I, that I um, went full-time into my own um, real estate firm. Yeah, and so for everyone listening to, there was a, I'll call it iconic, an iconic Fourth Arrow social media ad where you're where you're walking through the temper and talking yeah. about uh, the arrow, uh, the Fourth Arrow uh, camera arm. And so, <clears throat> did you have the marketing bug in business? Obviously, you had the business bug, but I mean, it, it modeled very similar to Dollar Shave Club that ad that yeah. you know you know, they grew to a billion dollar company and it's like the same formula. I just want to hear the back. Yeah. It was yeah, a culture like of that. the day. I don't know if I remember every detail about it. I, I believe I did script that ad and I, it was controversial. It was controversial. I think in our, in our own office. And then it was controversial when it, when it actually released. So it was, uh, it was unique. Uh, and yes, it did. I mean, it got, it, it worked. I mean, it was more, it more worked in just the sense of grabbing attention and people looking into it. Um, but there, there was like, you know, people criticizing it, like, why are you throwing these parts in the woods? And it's like, obviously we're picking these things up. Um, so yeah, it was fun to put together. It took like, it took, I don't, I don't like, I mean, that's probably one of the last ones I actually acted in or played the actor role. And it took us like, I don't know what it took us like for, it was, it's one, it's like one clip. So it took us like 50, hundred takes or something to actually say everything right. and do everything right so that's uh that's really funny but no i remember seeing that and it definitely caught a lot of traction which is uh um that was really cool i remember that so um so backing up into 2009 you bought your first real estate property and obviously right on the tail end of the 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 financial crisis of 08 09 and so in hindsight to your point it was a really good uh purchase so when you started with just one house and you know you sent over kind of what you have going on today did you ever imagine as just a general roadmap or was it one of those situations where you just got in and then just continued to learn and, and kept evolving and, and kept growing? Yeah, it kept, it kept pivoting. I mean, I think, um, I mean, you're familiar with bigger pockets program. I mean, there, there was all these different points, like, you know, you're, there's a certain point where you're like, okay, you know, r- rental homes are, are the dream. I want to own a thousand rental units. And it's like, well, I never got there, you know, uh, because the dream, switched and and then it switched to yeah switched to multi you know apartment buildings and then it switched to uh and then i bought a commercial building and realized how much more i love dealing with one large tenant rather than uh and 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 great professional relationships rather than your typical residential tenants so now you know now our biggest focus is probably acquiring so we flip we we're trying to flip, we flipped 140 homes last year. We're trying to flip 200 homes this year. So we got about a hundred guys in the field. So flipping is still flipping homes is 80% of what we do. Uh, But however, the probably the more important part is picking up the commercial real estate and the land, Mm -hmm. the acreage. Um, And that's kind of our long-term investment goals. You know, flipping homes is the job investing in commercial and land is the, is the investment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot to that. And and you're doing that at a high level. And so 
just give just give a, a brief run through of kind of your your portfolio right now, if you don't mind sharing. Like it, it could be somewhat vague, just so listeners can mm-hmm. get an idea of you know you started with one home to what you're at today, and then maybe we can reverse engineer of how you got there and some mistakes that you made. Yeah, so we've we've been selling a few apartment buildings, so I think we're down to um, about two. I think we have about two hundred residential units or two hundred residential doors, um, maybe two twenty, and then. We're probably up to, I think about a dozen commercial buildings now. And usually that's like a um, 50,000 to 200,000 square foot um, manufacturing facility or like a retail center. I mean, we've got like a retail center with like a Starbucks and Chipotle um, tenants like those, Um, but mostly it's industrial manufacturing buildings. Um, And then what we've really been doing for the last five years, we never really were officially flipping hunting land, but that's about six months ago, I hired um, Alan Messing, which would be a good guy for you to get to have in and dive into the weeds of, of flipping hunting land. But so we hired him about six months ago to actually head up our land division of our, of our company. Mm-hmm. Um, and the biggest thing there is like, we're going to be doing some really two it's it's you know two motives it's one to grow continually grow our the acreage um i mean you say it all the time your your guests say it all the time land they're not making any more of it and i mean they are in some places they're making more land in a few places and it's extremely expensive to uh dump dirt in the ocean and make a little more land and and um and with all the restrictions on that and wetlands and stuff like there really isn't you know it's so so we're buying land in Ohio, Indiana. We just put under contract, um, actually the Whitetail Properties agent, Kyle, in uh, Wisconsin. Um, we put a property under contract that we hope to be closing in a few weeks. Um, so, uh, you know, some of these like Ohio, some of the, we're targeting some of these like lower priced areas. So we're, we're just trying to, you know, grow in acreage and then also produce hunting properties that are all prepped um, to the market you know, that we can, you know, make a profit on, um, and have a lot of fun hunting in the process. Right. That's the, that's like talking with a lot of guys. It's like, obviously there it's an investment. Absolutely. But it's probably the only investment I know that you can get so much joy out of and so much, uh, yeah. so this, <clears throat> like whatever that's worth to some people, maybe it's worth a lot to some and maybe not as much to others, but you mentioned Ohio, Indiana, and Wisconsin. So, <clears throat> and, and really with the lack of inventory, I, I'm, I'm, almost uh when when did you guys buy your first acreage because i know you guys are, are pushing a thousand acres now yeah um yeah i think this wisconsin purchase i think will roll us over a thousand acres um the i mean i started kind of dabbling in little parcels like probably in 2014 15 um i think our first i think the first time i bought a 77 acre parcel which is probably one of my best land flips um to date I want to say it was like a 2018 purchase or 2019 purchase and then sold it about two years or a year and a half later. Um, was that Ohio? That was Michigan. Michigan. So, okay. Yeah. So everyone listening right now is wondering what, uh, well, number one, how are you finding all these deals? Right. Right. So like but to, to find that many houses to flip and then even finding um, a strong buy in Wisconsin right now for the recreational side. I mean, is there a strategy? Is it just plain old, old fashioned due diligence and, and work? Yeah. So, I mean, probably half our, in, in, when we flip homes, like 90% of our homes come off market or off market deals. So we have like, we kind of know marketing. We have our own marketing for homes. We don't really have that developed for hunting property. We've, we've sent mailers, I don't know if we've had any mailers where it's been word of mouth. It's been um, agents. I mean, probably 60% of the land we've bought has been on market and 40% has been off market. Um, And as you expand, I mean, agents, agents will call you with, you know, deals. I mean, there's all, there's always people who don't want to list their properties, but are still in touch with an agent. And so the agent, I mean, one of the best pieces we bought in Ohio last year, the guy wasn't ready to list it. You know, I'm sure you've got this all the time with clients, like, you know, not ready to list it, not ready to sell. But the agent had said to him, like, hey, if I can get you this number in this range, you know, and the guy was like, you know, sure, go, you know, have have somebody go walk it. So mm-hmm. the agent had me walk it. We produced an offer. The guy accepted. Um, 
you know, so in that sense, we're just coming in and, you know, going to kind of take the same strategy if we hold or flip it. And that's going to be to like assess the timber value, um, you know, make a whole habitat and hunting, hunting plan, um, assess all, assess all the wildlife, you know, that's there, um, develop neighbor relationships and, and, you know, it's, it's all, all of the classic, uh, things to improve a property for, for hunting. So Ohio, we have, we have a home base, you know, we have a home farm with a house and barn that we kind of operate out of, you know, when we go down, obviously everything we do in Michigan is usually within an hour of our, you know, where we live in Michigan. Mm -hmm. How did that, what, what tripped your trigger on the Wisconsin farm? Wisconsin is probably my favorite place to hunt in the world. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I, um, so originally, so way back in the day, we had a Michigan, Michigan whitetail pursuit was a DVD series, um, with, uh, Sean Vanderwall, I started Wisconsin whitetail pursuit, um, which had, it ran for like four years, just was a DVD series. Um, did well, it, you know, wasn't selling DVDs isn't a highly profitable place to be, but you know, it's a lot of fun. Um, and we did a lot of public land hunting. So we would often, so from that time on, I mean, for probably seven, eight years in a row, I would, I would go out to places like either like, um, yeah, River Falls or Richland Center or, you know, some small town Wisconsin place, you know, grab a hotel or Airbnb and, and hunt public ground. So, so I rarely hunt Michigan, Michigan public ground. Um, don't really enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> there was just, there was just, I think Wisconsin public ground is pretty saturated now, probably more than it was even when I was hunting it like seven, eight years ago, but we would just hunt, you know, MFL or public um, land in Wisconsin and, and, I had so many run-ins with big deer and, um, and yes, I shot, I shot a couple mature deer, you know, I, of course I shot the, you know, the busted up like 11 point, uh, that doesn't score well and, and, you know, messed up on the 180 inch giants <laughs> that, uh, that I have no proof of seeing. So, so, <laughs> but I, I just love the terrain. I, both of Southeast Ohio and like, um, you know, central West Wisconsin, I, I just love um that mix of agriculture you know with this just rocky cliffs and outcroppings and and ridges and so i i prefer that probably to like just straight up flat egg or mm -hmm. or just big woods hunting mm -hmm. no that that makes sense and i i guess uh <clears throat> you mentioned your first recreational farm being one of your best buys and that's something that i have seen with clients i've helped purchase their first farm and i don't know what that is but a lot of those folks you know, whether it's just getting into the market and it ends up being their springboard to, you know, other opportunities down the road. I see that to be a common theme with a lot of the first, first time land buyers I've helped, um, mm -hmm. that, that first buy being really good. And, uh, so I, that's just kind of my, my, my pitch to someone that's been on the sidelines. Like here's you, here you're, you're saying your first one was one of your best and I can rattle off a bunch of clients that I know offhand yeah. that their first farm was, you know, an exceptional buy. And I don't know if there's a mix of beginner's luck or if you're just so, <laughs> so in tune with what exactly you want. And obviously that it changes over time. But, um, so <clears throat> one question that I think a lot of people have is, okay, so this is, this is a lot of real estate, a lot. And what what is your strategy? Cause this is, this is a question I get pretty often uh, people email in. So they say, okay, yeah, that's great. I bought my first farm. Then I bought a second farm and it's hard for me to stair step up with mm. whatever income they have. And so obviously you have a lot of legs to your business and a lot of streams of income. What would be a piece of advice for someone that is a dual income household and they bought, you know, they're, they're at step number two or step number three in terms of the land journey. And they want to get to the next larger bump in acreage, but they're looking at it's like, man, how do I, how do I do this? What do you have any advice for someone like that? Make more money? I, yeah, no, <laughs> I do. I mean, so, so, I mean, one of the, we, we targeted Southeast Ohio cause I wanted our dollar to go farther. Right. So if you're, if you're trying to buy land, this is what's prevented me from being in Wisconsin up to this point is, is that five, six, seven, eight, nine grand an acre cost of land. We bought, you know, we are, we're buying pieces in Southeast Ohio for 50 grand for 70 grand. So like, you know, I mean, we're talking down payments, you know, so sometimes we'll buy it cash and then refinance it later because that's the client, you know, the, the seller wants a cash offer, but, um, you know, but other times, um, you know, I, yeah, I mean, think of one of the parcels I had three buddies kill a 
nice buck on a 35 acre parcel I bought this summer. So bought this 35 acre parcel. It was listed for 99,000. Um, this is where the agent relationships, you know, go away the agent, you know, the, his client was, you know, they didn't want to like price drop it right away, but his client was very motivated. And I said, you know, I walked it. I, I spent, I walked the property. I walked up the first ridge and said, I don't like this. Got back in my truck. And, and usually I don't do that. I just, there was no timber value. Um, didn't like how it set it up for hunting. Didn't like that it was 30 some five acres for 99,000 and got back in my truck, went home. Um, I was running, I was just on a trip in Ohio to renovate the house with my guys down there. And, you know, it, it got to be that conversation of, well, what price would you be interested in? And I was like, shoot, I should have, I should have actually walked that parcel instead of, uh, um, and keep in mind, I mean, it was 90 degrees and I'm hiking up ridges and, and, uh, you know, like you, you get demotivated pretty quickly. Um, about the 20th tick that you flick off. It's like, all right, I, I don't feel like, you know, <laughs> walking, you know, everybody has a tendency to buy ground on better weather days. I'm, I'm confident of that. So I agree. Um, but anyway, so I was like, well, I'll buy it at 70. And then we ended up settling at 72,000 and, and bought it. But yeah, my down payment on that was like with Midwest farm credit, I think was like $10,000. Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you know, you talk about your average household income of what, like, how fast can you save $10,000? Well, I bet my guess is that people can save that pretty fast. Um, so, um, the, I mean, the second piece of advice I would say is go sell that first or second farm, you know, like put those improvements in and instead of getting super attached to it or emotional about it, go put it on the market, put it on the market for a price that you would be happy with and see if it goes and, and roll that, uh, you know, 1031 into, into your next farm. Yeah. You bring up a, a very key thing, especially when it comes to land emotion. And a lot of people are emotional when they buy their first farm and, and everyone I've talked to that has, has grown into something similar to what you're talking about. Like you, you can't fall in love with your first farm because ultimately it ends up being your, your springboard and you know, you saved up your down payment, you have that basis and then hopefully you have some profit and then you're able to 1031 and, and go find something else. But I think it's uh, <clears throat> the emotion of buying something. Usually people are nervous or scared and then people are emotional or scared when they sell it of, is it going to be better than what I already have or am I making a mistake? And so how do you, do you just, have you personally just built up a callus of that with this doing so much, general real estate or do you just look at it as hey it's a it's a business transaction and uh for where i'm at and where i want to go this is what has to happen i'm subject to all those same things too i mean you know I, i'm you know this wisconsin piece we're under contract with like uh a month ago three weeks ago when we went under contract with it we talked about it like a 5.9 percent interest rate and now rates just tick back up and now we're talking about like a 6.8 percent interest rate and it's just like you know, just the math is getting worse on it. So my emotions are coming into play and it's just, it's just, um, so no, there's always frustrations. There's always emotions. You know, I probably 10% of properties I regret, you know, buying, um, you know, what, 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 why would you regret a purchase? So what you bought a farm. So there's one that has to be at the top of mind right now. So maybe, maybe share why you regret buying a specific piece and, and what, uh, what went wrong or what, you know, why wasn't it what you thought it was? I mean, two two things come to mind right away. I mean, the the two things that I think would make me, after the fact, not excited about a purchase, you know, are are just number one, neighbors. Um, you buy ground, neighbors are bad. You know, that's that's a killer. Um, and second one is just you know, put in the time and money, and it just does not produce big deer. You know, mm -hmm. like. You know, I, I've had those. I mean, I've had. It's surprising what does produce big deer and what doesn't. You know, and and like my home farm in Ohio, um, there's some. Um, you know, for example, I've got some Amish neighbors who I really, I really like them. They're great people, and guess what? They shoot a lot of deer. Um, so like my home farm this year, I I I have a you know it's 108 acres. I would love to walk out, you know, like I did the previous year. You know roll out of bed in the morning, you know, 80 yards down the driveway, pop up in a stand and I'm in one of, you know, the best places I can be to shoot a big deer. Well, this, this year, I mean, there just wasn't a big deer there. So, um, 
you know, so, I mean, that's, that's why I, I love, that's why I love the quantity game. Maybe it is like, I'd rather own, I'd rather own those unless I can actually be on like six, 800 acres, which I haven't been able to, you know, amass that in one spot. I'd rather have thirties and fifties and, you know, all over the place. Um, especially in a place like Southeast Ohio, like central West Wisconsin, um, here in Michigan, I mean, it, it's, um, like the hunting is definitely worse than those those places and and yeah i i don't i'm not looking for 30 acres here because you'll be surrounded by 10 and 20 acre parcels and there will be a guy in every tree so yeah 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 that's uh that's a really big thing and i think uh you know neighbors are, are it's it's funny how this works every time someone buys a piece and this has been my experience of like the it sounds bad but the, all right, they buy the farm and then probably the second or third thought they have onyx open and they're like oh i wonder if i can buy this 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 <laughs> i can start mm-hmm. start piecing all these things together and i think it's human nature of expanding you know whatever you have but um so neighbors and just the fact of maybe just a, a piece doesn't produce what it, what it's thought so did you a piece that you regret buying for example <clears throat> have you sold any of those or are you just holding holding on to them and riding out the storm I mean, one thing I love doing with like, even on a piece that's like in a downhill in your mind is I love, you know, I love buying pieces with sufficient road frontage to do splits. So, you know, I will take my cash out of that piece step by step. Um, and, and I've had just great success doing that. So, I mean, one, the reason I've been able to grow is not, you know, I mean, hopefully there's some smart decisions in there, but a huge reason I've been able to grow is just by the, just the basics of, of, you know, it's all the simple things is, you know, is buying the piece right, getting the timber value, splitting it into two or three parcels. Um, you know, so there's pieces where I'll wind up with having essentially free land after I do my split and getting all my cash out of that piece and leaving a piece. So now I've got a smaller piece, but it's close to free. You know, I mean, it's, um, yeah, so I have sold, I mean, there's one piece I sold in Michigan here where that's what I, I kind of just leveled down like it had tillable. I sold off the tillable this whole time. The market's rising. I had bought it right. It was funny on the last day, the morning I was going to list it. Um, it's I shot a good buck for the first time in two years. I shot a good buck, really the first good buck I saw on the parcel and shot it. And so we listed it that morning with a success picture of that year <laughs> that I killed that morning. So um you know, so and that probably that picture probably made me a little bit of money. Like it, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, it was a hundred and twenty-five inch, uh, eight point beautiful three-year-old deer, which is a trophy here. Um, yeah. You know, so yeah, I don't know if a roundabout way that I got to answer your question, but um, you know, I a lot of times we're buying home, like we're buying a rundown farmhouse on that, you know, with thirty-five acres. You know, we parcel off that farm we do a lot of i mean that's where the home flipping business comes into play is you know we're parceling off that house on two to five acres selling that separate usually that land and that house are worth more separately as those are separate buyers not Mm -hmm. um you know it's a higher value to split those things up so which i I mean i hate splitting land too it's it's the kind of the nature of every parcels it's rare when parcels get bigger you know they usually get smaller but um so we're, we're doing that too Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good key takeaway. And there was a uh, Cody Bittner, he was on an episode here recently. And that was the first piece that he bought. And uh, another example of, you know, he felt like he did really good on that first piece. And it was a farmhouse, someone bought the farmhouse, and then he bought the acreage mm-hmm. because the people that bought the house didn't want the additional acreage. And uh, mm-hmm. how w- with, um, I mean, I feel like you're kind of in a unique situation, too, which is which is great to have a I assume you have to have a team of contractors and a bunch of resources to go in and, and get that type of project, like update or renovate a, you know, older farmhouse in a, in a quick fashion. Like how much, how many, like, is this a perfect adjacency to what you have going on for, for this too? I have to imagine. Right. Yeah. And, and at the same time, you know, if you didn't have that, you know, still doing the split and selling the fixer upper farmhouse as is, is still a money making, you know, in generally, you know, if you bought the piece, right, it's still, most of those people don't want to do that. Most of you say, why, why doesn't the original seller just don't do that? I, I don't find most agents want to, you know, push their seller into doing that. Most, most sellers don't want to go through all that extra work doing that. So there, there's some, there's some low hanging fruit there with when you see a house on a parcel and you desire that parcel for hunting. Like usually that's 
we've we've been pretty easily be able to make those things work out, be profitable even without fixing the house or or call the right contractors to mm -hmm. to do that. Yeah. So. What um so as far as uh, how do how do you manage debt load in general? So or I guess what have you learned about managing debt load, especially with the interest rates environment that we're in now? Obviously, mm -hmm. the Fed says they're supposed to be lowered, uh, you know, throughout this year, and who knows? Yeah, not, really not looking happen. like it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I feel like I swear they just said that to boost consumer confidence. Um, but yeah. it, that's that's a side tangent. But anyways, what what's some advice that you have on for folks to to manage debt load? Yeah, I mean, I like running. You know, like again, we've been we've been. The business has grown because of all the market appreciation. So, you know, we haven't done a lot of like cash out refinance um, to, you know, thing. But on, the, you know, on a lot of those, you know, we buy a piece for, I think one piece we bought for 130 grand right down the road, actually, from that $72,000 piece. So we buy it for 130 grand. It's our, I mean, our down payment's like 20,000, 25,000 um, in that range. Um, and I mean, we're going to be getting a forty-five thousand dollar timber check, you know, here soon on that. So I mean, you almost you almost have to be careful because you can quickly, you know, I mean, I can buy up a lot more land if I want, uh, and by just roll, you know, taking that timber money, rolling it in the next down payment. But yeah, what you have to watch out for is what is that monthly payment. And uh, so one thing we're looking at is, I mean, we've got a, you know, like the Wisconsin piece has a very nice little furnished house on it. Um, it was like a vacation house before, so we'll probably turn that into an Airbnb, um, you know, and get, you know, we've got little chunks of tillable everywhere. So kind of just making every dollar count and the revenues you can pull off these parcels. Um, but, you know, hunting, you know, us hunting our own parcels doesn't, you know, there's no, there's no revenue there. So, you know, we're, we are selling parcels to make money. And, and I think, you know, we buy them even last year, I got a piece in, we bought a piece, uh, really had really bad access in Ohio, um, 200 acres for $289,000. So it's, you know, 1400 bucks an acre, about as cheap as you're going to get land anywhere in the United States, I think. And um, great hunting, um, had two buddies shoot bucks on that piece this year, um, plus a couple more uh, missed, uh, missed deer. And... Um, just a great piece, but extremely trashy area. Like, I mean, if I can say this, the worst trailer park ever to, you know, drive through to this piece. Well, on the other side of this piece, there's a really nice neighborhood. We just, it, uh, 30 acres came on market that butts up in our piece. And now we have like beautiful access, um, you know, to this, to this piece after buying that additional access. Um, so, you know, so and and honestly, I mean, I'm emotionally attached to this piece, and we're probably going to list it for sale because the money, you know, like, I think the profit's there, and then we'll go pursue that. So, yeah, probably. Um, again, going probably going off on a tangent there, but uh, that's well, no, it, what it's, we're doing it's really piece. it's really important because I think ultimately when you look at a piece, it's like how how can we force appreciation? How can we make it better? Obviously, the biggest deterrent of this piece was you had to drive through uh, less than savory scenery, and then okay, well now you have two-sided access even if even if one mm -hmm. side isn't uh, too pretty but now you have better access and i think that's that's a really creative thing and i think a lot of pieces could could go for maybe a four to an eight if you're able to buy even a five acre sliver that butts up to it and you can get two-sided access right. and it opens up the door to a lot of other opportunities too on how if you did decide to split it or right or you just have a piece with with access and this is something i've i've noticed with a lot of people i've talked to I feel as buyers, as land buyers across the board, and this is the same thing for whitetail hunting, the same thing for everything in the world where people get more sophisticated with more information and people will scrutinize a farm pretty heavily if the access is bad. And I understand why. And I felt mm -hmm. like before you might've been able to get away with, w w get away with not having great access because people didn't value it as much as what it is today. Like I, I have a handful of clients that say, I only want something with East access, Southeast access period. Yeah. I was like, you know, there's ways to work around that, but that's their hard rule. And so, well, yeah, so you're, you're limiting some buyers just by them having that mindset and whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but that's, that's a conversation I'm having more and more uh, with folks. That's funny. Cause I have, I have the problem in Michigan where like, I better be ready to hunt every North wind because I own all these 
parcels that are on the same side of the road with the same egg and wood setup. So I've got like a million North wind tree, <laughs> tree stands, you know? Uh -huh. So I just like, I wish the whole season was a, a North, uh, North wind. Um, but yeah, yeah. So that's, that's interesting. And, and we coming in it from like a real estate investment standpoint, we often won't, you know, look at like, we see the price per acre as like number one. And then, and then we buy, you know, we buy this crap land, if you want to call it and, and say, all right, where, where can a food plot go? Where can we make a trail system that allows for hunting a variety of wind directions? Where can we force a building site? You know, here we, I mean, we do a lot of, you know, one of our greatest contacts in Ohio is an Amish excavator and uh, he, he rents a dozer every time we want work done. And I mean, this dude works. I mean, I get him on trail cameras at, at two in the morning with running his excavator around. I don't know what uh, it's, it's just, uh, so you get these, yeah, he's amazing contact and, uh, and, and I, I will not share his contact information either. So you don't want to be busy. Yeah. It's like a good contractor. You don't want to yeah. share their number to everyone, but that's honestly, so, so he's been, he's been amazing for us and, and, and you get, yeah, a couple of these good vendors. I mean, we have a great logger down there now. Yeah. Great logging contact, great excavator. So we, I mean, you get those and you can have, you know, we can have, uh, we can do a lot of property development in a matter of a couple of weeks. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that it, like, that's the team you want to assemble, right? Whether it's a good forester or a good logger or a, a good dirt work contact, like that's the, mm -hmm. that's the dream team. If you're looking to improve a parcel in, in a good fashion. And so when you're looking at something like doing some of those projects have you was there a learning curve on pricing that stuff out or did you have an idea how much it would cost and was it more than what you thought less than you thought or what's been the learning curve there yeah there's definitely been a learning curve i mean uh, some of that soil is tough to grow in anything so we'll you know we'll put money into seed and what we think will be a beautiful food plot and then it's a disaster and then so now we're relocating to like a, a wetter you know more of like a area with a natural spring and that's or, or a, a bottom instead of a top to try to make the you know food work um specifically in southeast ohio everything has been more affordable than it is up by us so pricing has been great honestly um there, there's always surprises i mean like right now we want to put in a well in this wisconsin piece and, and like a well usually costs ten thousand dollars you know here eight to eight to twelve thousand for your average well well, by the time they hit water there, I mean, and, and the rules for wells in Wisconsin, it's like, it's going to be like a $35,000, you know, well, and that's a, a couple of vendors have, have bid that. So it's not like, it's not like we're getting uh, hosed on, on one vendor. So, you know, there's things like that where, yeah, we're, we get a little shell shocked on, you know, and, and, and can make some buying mistakes on that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, we're not... We're not dealing with very our property development plan. We rarely will spend more than like ten grand on a property. Usually, we're spending like you know three to six thousand dollars on a full property development plan, mm -hmm. which will involve chainsaw work, you know, a couple grand worth of excavator trail system work, um, you know, a lot of a lot of you know that thirty five acres had like a trailer, um, just a destroyed trailer home on it. So you know paying pain to remove that things like that and cleaning up the property yeah yeah that makes yeah those are all very true things and i do you think that just the locality of where that is like i would imagine dirt work i i always encourage people to get bids on that because where you're at in the country that's going to vary if you're in a varies. lower income area it's probably going to be more affordable if you're in a metro area whether it's right or wrong it's gonna be more expensive even though it's the same kind of work yeah i think we're like i think he's i don't know what he's billing us for dozer work i think it's like 60 bucks an hour for running a dozer so <laughs> yeah there's a like skid work up here is <laughs> substantially more yeah. than that which is crazy so yeah. do you so how far how far of a drive is that for you to from michigan to where you're like your home base for ohio yeah six okay. and a half hours um yeah, the place we just bought in Wisconsin, six and a half hours. The we just have one property in Indiana is like five and a half hours, and then the Ohio is six and a half hours. And yeah, I think we have six or seven properties there now. Probably, probably should have a couple more by hunting season mm -hmm. as well. So Ohio is our main, um, you know, main plan for 
growing an acreage and, you know, flipping a few parcels as well. Mm -hmm. Do you, is that six, six and a half hour drive? Does that get old or, or since you have a place to crash there, it's not as bad because I, this is a question I get often and obviously it's dependent on, on the person, but if you're, let's say you want to do a day trip, I feel like two hours is about a yep. good radius. Um, what are yep. your thoughts? I agree. On, yeah, okay. I am, uh, I am married with four, four kids and, uh, I can't, um, you know, we're, the kids are getting to ages where like, I think as this spring break, we're going to, you know, go down there as a family trip. And that's exciting because we have not done that yet. Um, it's pretty limited when I can go down there. I mean, to probably go down to probably three times to hunt. So it's kind of becomes my hunting vacation, right? Like, you know, in Michigan, I try to work all of my hunting around work. Um, if I'm going to Ohio, I'm, I'm going hunting there for a week. And that's, and it's, it's, it's deer camp, you know, there's eight or 10 of us there. It's, you know, it's a great time. So for hunting wise, I mean, the trip is insignificant for like property prep and planning wise. I mean, that's why it's important to have the boots on the ground for like our logger will actually go walk a property and he's not only building a logging quote, like so property hits the market. We trust our agent enough and our logging logger enough we will buy that property without ever seeing it. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we're not going, some of the properties we buy, we're not going down there to actually see them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which I mean, I would totally, if you're buying your first or second farm, you're probably not going to do that. Um, but we trust these guys enough to tell us about the neighbors, tell us, you know, about the road frontage, accessibility, you know, the deer sign, the timber value. I mean, we trust them on all those things. So that part's, part of it makes it easy, but you know, I'm probably going to go down there four or five times a year. Alan, Alan is probably going down there seven or eight times a year. So, mm -hmm. yeah. What's, what are, I mean, is there a punch list or a, a mental checklist of, for someone that wants to buy their first farm? Obviously you have a few, un, you have, you know, more than a few under your belt, but what someone listening, they're thinking, okay, I have some money saved up and you know, interest rates are what, you know, they are what they are. What advice or mental checklist would you provide them to, to run through? And I know we covered a lot of these things, but I, 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 yeah. I think anything jumps out. Yeah. I mean, if somebody, I mean, I've always encountered a lot of people that are just never willing to take that first step. Um, and I think, I think owning a small farm that doesn't, uh, doesn't check all your boxes is better than owning no farm at all. So, I mean, I think that's the first thing is like, just get into something. Um, and that experience will teach you what you actually want and need. Um, to be able to make your purchasing will become so much smarter on number three and four, um, you know, and, and, and your, your comfort with the whole transaction process will be there. It's so everything's so unpredictable, you know, like, I mean, neighbors, you know, the place where I think we're gonna have neighbor problems, we, we don't. And then the place that I think is going to be great neighbor relationships, all of a sudden we've got some big issues. So um, it's hard to forecast a lot of, a lot of things um you know advice for somebody buying out of you know out of area out of state um you know again i think i think it's more about just getting i mean your 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 agent is probably the most important um you know probably the most important thing to give you all of the an agent that actually gives you wisdom um is probably step step one Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's that's a great piece of advice. Obviously, you've worked with a bunch of agents all mm -hmm. across the board. What do you think for someone that's listening that wants to interview an agent and to see if they're a good fit? What are some questions that you ask? Like, let's say you want to buy in West Virginia or whatever other state that you haven't gone to yet. What's your process of finding your go to guy? It's a it's a mixed bag. So like, you know, uh, we we will use multiple agents in one area just cause we're buying a lot of stuff and they all kind of have their fortes. Um, we'll even, you know, I will be pretty quick to call up the listing agent on a parcel that I, especially a parcel that like hits, you know, I'm on it day one and it appears underpriced, you know, I'll be, I'm usually going to go straight to the listing agent and make that call. Um, if it's not, you know, I mean, right now, I mean, our, my favorite there, you know, I've got um, a great agent in Southeast Ohio. Um, Josh Henry is his name. And he's, he's, you know, he's 
he's just such a resource on contact. So I, I think, I think I would almost start with that is, is like, you know, first, what are your goals for the property? You know, you almost want, if you're pursuing like a hunting property with investment, I mean, you, you want the guy to hunt, you want him to be fit. I've had agents like take me, you know, halfway up the first hill and be <laughs> puffing and puffing and, and they can't guide me through the rest of the property, you know, and, and they can't, and they don't want me to go like, you know, or, or just, I've had a lot of not great experiences with agents who, you know, don't know, act like they know a little bit about hunting. They don't know a thing about hunting and uh, act like they know about the land values. And it's, it's clear that they, they don't. So, I mean, how to interview, I, yeah, I would, that's tough. I mean, I think interviewing them about, I mean, timber value is always a big thing to me. So interviewing them about, um, you'll, you'll quickly get a feel. I think when you start asking questions about timber value, about their hunting, uh, about their transactions, I think you'll quickly, it's almost more of a feel, a gut feel thing than probably anything, anything else. The agents who hustle, I feel like will, will, they'll always be in touch with you, sending you stuff, you know, even, even off market leads. Um, so, you know, kind of having an agent that you hopefully be friends with and not, but that you don't annoy them all the time is, is uh, probably a good path to, to be on. It, it varies so much in what kind of parcel you're pursuing. Like if you're pursuing a parcel to build a home on and hunt like that, to me, that's a different, whole different set of things that you're kind of um, looking for. If you're just looking to get to pay at market or under market pricing for a hunting parcel, um, or for you, the main goal is shooting a big deer on. Like, I, I, I just really want, I don't want to walk that parcel with an agent who just doesn't know how to hunt deer. I want to be able to talk through things with him. So, mm -hmm. uh, and those, those agents can be kind of hard to find. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that's all really good feedback. <clears throat> Here's a question for you. Would you rather buy a great farm at a fair price or a fair, par fair farm at a great price? I'll buy the fair farm at a great price all day long. Really? Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay. What Okay. What about uh, a, a bad farm at a great price or a great farm? At I price? like that too. <laughs> so what about what about some things that you, you can't necessarily fix? Like, So when I think of a bad farm, I'm thinking bad access, bad neighbors, and the Oof, the bad neighbors one if it's clear that they're bad neighbors i'm gonna struggle with that one a little bit but then but then i mean the worst the far it wasn't just the trailer park on this one parcel i mean the other neighbors were bad i walked up to the one house to see if we could get access through their parcel we actually there's a, like a legal easement through this other parcel and i walked up to this sketchy house i did not see all the dogs on the porch um, that were laying there nicely sleeping. I mean, the lady I talked to was high as a kite. The, 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 all the dogs are growling at me. And, you know, when she said, you know, whatever her husband or whatever will be home at some point to talk to him. But then she made some comments like, you might not want to talk to him. I'm like, I don't care if we have an easement through this parcel. I'm not using it. You right. Know? So it's just like, <laughs> And you still bought that. That's the piece you bought for like. That's years. the piece we bought. Yeah, I can't. I can't help myself when you know when something's that's a good uh, that's good of a deal. And now we own the now we own access in a beautiful neighborhood on the other side, and uh, and it worked out. Um, but you know, again, I, that's not a parcel I'm buying to build my own home on, uh, which is very different. You know, I would never buy that piece to build my home on. But I'm gonna. T at, you know, if the price is really right, I'm going to take some risks on on that. I've just had, I've had, you know, like you say a great farm. Well, how do you guarantee it's, you know, great? What are all the things that mean? Great. So, you know, even if it has a great trail camera history, great harvest. Is, I mean, I would, if it's got all of those things, if it's got great access, got all of those things, I, I tend to find those farms often are just, they're going to be overpriced. Now, they're not going to be at market pricing. They'll be over market pricing. I just have a very hard time paying that to absolute top of the market. I'd rather buy the crap, fix it up and, uh, and make it beautiful and make it into a great farm mm -hmm. as best as it can be. And, and then either, you know, keep it or sell it. I, I've just had too many great farms that looks the best. Um, that might be there. So you were saying you've seen 
all these different pieces that, you know, have all these things that give attributes and great attributes. And then you feel that it's, it's testing the market or it's resetting what is fair market value for a piece. And, and, uh, so yeah. I, and do you, th- do you think that has something to do with just your personality of like, you're, you're buying crappy houses and you're making them nice and, yep. and, and yep. in the stage of your life too. Cause I could see a guy that's like 50 or 55 and he has yeah. kids. And at that point I would say buy the great farm at a fair price. Absolutely. A young guy that's just getting started. I think that's, that's a good distinction. I think number one thing I'm chasing is, is equity. So, you know, I, I am chasing. So when I see that just junk trailer home on the front of a property, like, great. I know how to remove that. I know how to add value. I mean, just removing that trailer adds value mm-hmm. to the parcel, right? I'm just, people don't like, a lot of your end buyers don't like problems. So I'm, yeah, I am. I'm targeting the problem parcels because they're a deal and I know it's economical and I can, I can usually remove the problems. I know you can't remove, you know, good access, like great access with the right wind directions. I know there's only so much you can do um, on that, but that's, that's when you start calling neighbors and getting access from that other side and suddenly you have phenomenal access. Mm -hmm. So there's a Pat Porter. He's been on this podcast a handful of times and what's something he shared has always stuck with me is people, typically don't have imagination and, and your job is to remove the imagination, meaning fixing those things. Like for example, a rundown trailers on the front of the property. A lot of people aren't going to look past that. They can't picture it without that trailer gone. It's like, it's there, mm-hmm. it's fact, but someone like you can say, Oh, that's a, that's a day job. Hire someone, get rid of it. And now the imagination is removed and it looks a lot better. Yeah. I do like to look at everything with just a number, you know, it's $4,000 to get that trailer gone. Um, you know, that, that's, that's just a number. And, and I like, I mean, you know, timber always plays a huge part of it too. And sometimes I'm wrong on timber. Sometimes I think there's, you know, 40 K and there's only 25 K and that's why I always like to, I'd rather almost have a logger walk the parcel than, than, than me walk it. Um, but that's, there's always a game to play there too. Cause it's like, okay, you might get a $40,000 quote, but can he actually get on it in any month other than July and August when he's going to be full of great mm-hmm. timber contracts anyways. So having a good logger that gives you a quote and tells you when he can kind of guarantee that he'll actually do it, um, you know, it is good too. Because then you're left, you know, I mean, the bad thing about timber is you're often left, even a good logger, it's your property is still going to look kind of crappy, you know, even if he leaves the trails. You're going to get a better trail system probably, uh, but you're going to get a, a woods that doesn't look great for a year or two. And then, you know, some of that, maybe you want to cut some tops out. Maybe you want to leave them for habitat. Um, You know, so we're still going through all of those things on parcels that we're selling is like, okay, we go get our $40,000 worth of timber. out. Like what did we actually cost the property in terms of resale? How long do we have to, you know, wait? Um, You know, are we, most properties we're marketing for the deer hunter and the deer hunter doesn't typically like they want to see some thick cover. They can see some crappy things as long as they see a really good uh, trail camera history, even a harvest history, food plots, blinds, you know, tree stand setups of multiple wind directions and kind of check all their boxes. Then we've got a good, a good property. So. Mm-hmm. Have you, have you ever looked at a piece? I got a couple of questions. One, one that comes to mind is for example, let's say you buy a piece, there's $40,000 of timber value. And have you guys left any of that for the next person and saying, and yeah. leaving it as more pristine? Cause I, I think, I think that's a, I think there's two different ways to kind of cut that. Like, okay, so we have, yeah. we have a raise of $40,000 and we're going to leave that, but we're going to sell for X price. Or, I mean, what's your, what's your strategy behind that? We used to like 14, we, we, that's exactly what we've kind of switched to. We used to like like 14 inch cuts or even 12 inch plus cuts, like give us every dollar you can because we're focused on our own hunting. And more lately we're like, no, let's, let's, do, a, let's do a blend here. Let's do just 16 inch plus. Um, let's even pick out a few, um, you know, pick out a few oak trees that we want to keep. Um, let, let's make sure this property stays beautiful and we're not getting the maximum check. So often we'll get a quote of, you know, 40,000 for a 40, 14 inch plus everything over 14 inches cut. And then it'll be like 28,000 for everything 16 inches and over. And usually that's what we're going to, we're going to go with and leave some tim- leave that strong timber value for the next buyer, because that's going to be looked at with a good amount of value. 
Mm -hmm. Here's a, here's another email I get often. And it's uh, usually after a guest like yourself that owns rental units and everything else. And I think a lot of guys that are maybe in chapter one, meaning they're maybe they own one rental property already, or maybe they're saving up and they're like, do I buy a rental property or do I buy a piece of ground? What is more Mm -hmm. wise? And I think it's, I think it roots down to whatever their personal goals are, but is there anything that if you had to start all over, would you have started buying land sooner or would you have waited longer to buy land or, and bought more rental properties and just think of someone that's kind of just getting started, what you would tell them. Yeah. Um, everything I feel like is hard to get into right now. Like everything, everything feels like, I mean, we don't, you know, if we knew what the market would do two years from now, we would all take actions. You know, we could all make a ton of money if we knew the future and we don't know that. And everything feels like it's higher, you know, interest rates feel like they're high prices feel like they're high. Um, the rental numbers like hardly make sense on residential rentals land doesn't like, you know, it's expensive to sustain land. I mean, you know, you never want to go into an investment, absolutely counting on the appreciation. Um, I'd have a very time, hard time steering one thing or another. I always believe there's better, probably better cash flow in most, you know, residential rental or commercial rental type properties. Um, I've had some of my greatest appreciation and greatest profitability on land historically. So I, I've, you know, some of my land deals have been like the best flips um, again, but that's just, that's just, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a good buy and then, and then massive market growth over a year, year and a half. And you suddenly you've got that, just that massive appreciation. So Mm -hmm. that's a tough question. I mean, I don't, um, I think it depends what other investments, you know, that you have. It's hard for me to look at, you know, buying one, like if I didn't own any real estate, I think I would pursue buying a rent, go buying a duplex, you know, before, going and buying a hunting parcel. Um, and, and why is that? I I think it's, you know, I think your, your combination of, yeah, I think the appreciation is similar. You'd probably know more than I would on what, you know, what different rates of appreciation in different areas. But I think, I think the combination of appreciation, debt pay down and cash flow is a better scenario than, when you buy a hunting parcel that maybe doesn't have, you know, even if it's got tillable on it, you still never cover like, yeah, but a good rec farms, uh, like you're found a deal. If you can get 3% appreciate or 3% uh, return on a rec farm like that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why it just doesn't, you know, that's why to me, a duplex comes first and building, you know, building a, you know, building a, a mini real estate empire that, uh, you know, has, has the equity and has some cash flow and then, and then buying, you know, the farm to me makes sense, but I would tell you to just do, uh, you know, go do both in a small way, you know, go buy, you know, go buy that $70,000 there. I mean, there are still parcels that hit that are a hundred grand, um, in some of these areas and go, go buy that, uh, you know, that out of state or, you know, uh, buy that kind of, uh, your mini, a mini version of your dream farm and go, go do it both as I guess what I would that, and so, so, and so, as part of the strategy behind buying the duplex first, to okay, so now you have cash flow coming from the duplex, and then you save up money, or maybe you do a cash out mm-hmm. refinance on that property, and then you go buy the hundred thousand dollar farm to basically have those rental payments help pay for the farm. Is that the thought process behind that? Yeah, I, I think. I mean, a farm costs me money, right? Like, I don't, you know, I don't make my monthly payments don't get paid. Largely speaking, I mean, you know calculate the timber value. I mean, you know, you can make the argument for, for a while, your farm will pay for your monthly payment. But um, for the most part, the farms that I have bought, the big wins have all been on, you know, appreciation slash land improvement. So if you're not, if you're not specifically going in there to improve land and flip, like you're buying this as a buy and hold, that hunting farm is probably you got going to make you money. It's just going to cost you money as it appreciates the value. So it's, it's equity growth. So I think, I think really that's what it comes down to is, are you after making money? Like if you're making cash, or are you just after growing, you know, equity? If you're, if, 
if equity growth, I mean, if you said to me, is buying land or investing in the stock market, you know, which one of those would you do? I would tell you all day long, go buy that hunting farm. One, the bank will actually loan you money. They're not going to loan you money to go buy Bitcoin. Uh, right. yeah, I like Bitcoin as well, yeah. by the way, but, well, we'll <laughs> but nobody, about- nobody's loaning, nobody's loaning you money to do that. Um, you know, and they will loan you money to buy a hunting. So, so, you know, your $20,000 down is going to go a lot farther in real estate. So I'm always going to push real estate, but I, it would be a very individual scenario of, do I buy the rental house or, or do I buy the, buy the, the hunting farm? So, so I give you, I give you $500,000. How are you deploying that between Bitcoin rental properties and land? And you got to spend, you got to spend it in the next our Bitcoin's near an all-time high, right? So this is like, Calvin, mm-hmm. you have one, you have one week to spend a half million dollars. Go do it. Go wild. How are you going to make? How are you going to deploy those dollars? I would, uh, I would go buy two finance properties. I would go buy a million dollar commercial property with two hundred fifty thousand dollars down. Um, that is a low cash flow, but very strong, strong tenant, um, strong tenant, good building. Um, and then I would go buy that hunting farm. That I'd go buy that million dollar hunting farm with uh, my other twenty five percent down, and uh, and I, I would do that. I would do that type sort of 50-50 ratio um, there. So our our no, business. No, no, I, I don't. I don't know what our percentages are. I mean, we definitely hold more in commercial ground. You know, commercial cash flowing properties than we do in in hunting ground. So I I the hunting the the investing in land and farms is not just it's it's you know this is not a fun money thing this is like this is we believe that land appreciation will occur for a good long time or for forever and and that's you know that's buying large acreage parcels which i mean we're getting to the point where anything over 20 acres is big whereas when our grandparents were around i mean 200 acres wasn't even big so just that that just seeing where in one or two generations land has gone um it just i i want a lot and i want 20 to 30 percent of our portfolio to be land holdings and obviously hunting is my favorite thing to do it's 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 the the perfect combo for what i what i enjoy most which is probably land and, and whitetails so mm-hmm. yeah but no bitcoin in that mix no i I, you know, the funny thing is, I, I think I bought a couple grand worth of Bitcoin today. I just, I just been, I, I've been buying all the way, all the way up, um, but not, you know, just not large. But I mean, you yeah, sure we'll put ten grand in that five hundred okay. grand of Bitcoin. Okay. So okay, yeah. That, so you've been. That's it though. I've I've been dollar. I, I think I yeah. I bu- I didn't buy in big on Bitcoin. I had buddies who who did. I I, bu- I did buy some at like eight grand and eleven grand, and I thought I was buying in pretty high then, and and. Uh, yeah, I don't know what it's at, like sixty six or something today. So yeah, I've been I've been dollar cost averaging most of the year. Uh, I I don't I don't I have not gone down that wormhole, but I, feel I like- do I do think when we get smoked, I mean, you know, what what do you think? You know, if our economy gets something big happens, uh, which it will at some point, you know, what do you think uh, Reckland you know values do to compared to say? other real estate do you think they get hurt more than other real estate or do you think that they've think, weathered they've proved they could weather the storm i think it'd be hyper localized honestly like you're in michigan and i would say you guys got hit by the housing crisis 0809 harder than than probably anyone and then mm-hmm. you go to other parts of the country so i, I think it'd be hyper localized depending on just local economies and everything else i think and maybe major depressed areas that it could get beat up and then i think mm-hmm. uh the edge of town or like within an hour of a metro area it'll go down but i don't think it'll be as drastic as some of the other areas and like you could you could make that same argument even in the housing market this year um uh, san francisco has gotten beat up uh with mm-hmm. with their housing and then if you look at some other parts in the country uh, houses are still appreciating so i think mm-hmm. i think it'd be hyper localized and i think that's the essence of having a good agent but i wish i knew and i wish i could hedge some giant bet <laughs> but I'm, I'm guessing just like everyone else yeah yeah, but uh, but yeah, and I think there's been there's just been this. I feel like there's been uncertainty in the market almost in every turn the last since COVID really. Right. 
people thought it was going to go down and then inflation was really high. And then some really smart people are saying, well, land's the best hedge against inflation. So then a lot of money went into land and then people, well, interest rates are going up. So land's going to go down. And then you look at auction results and they're still going yeah. really strong. So I, I had, don't know. I had a couple friends I can think at specific points. So like it, they're about 2011, 12 here, everybody was fairly confident in real estate and rentals were instead of being 30 grand, they were 50 grand. And so lots of people, you know, lots of people I know just started, you know, buying up, buying up rentals. People were moving back into West Michigan rather than out of West Michigan. Everything was getting really healthy, but stuff was still cheap. And then I think in 2017, I had, you know, a buddy like sell his entire portfolio and, and a lot of people sold out in like 17, 18, 19 expecting, and then just like sat on that cash to, to, to wait, you know, for that crash they knew was coming. And then it just boomed, you know, and, and that cash is so, you know, I don't want to say worthless, but became worth so much less than if they had hung on to that. So that's what, I mean, I, you know, real estate is such a, you know, a fun thing, but yeah, you do, you know, you go buy that hunting farm and then it lowers in value. Like you have to have the, the, the income to hang on to that, to weather, to weather the storm. So it will rebound in value. It's just, you know, you just don't know when. Yeah. Um, what what I've been that, telling clients so. here a lot this year is yeah. I, I would look at any buy as probably a three to five year hold. Like I would go into that thinking I, I can weather whatever storm for three to five years. And that's, that's my general consensus. I know it's kind of vague, mm -hmm. but there's a lot mm -hmm. of guys that have been spoiled here the last couple of years where they bought something and you know, it's appreciated a thousand dollars an acre in a, in a pretty short amount of time. And, and so mm -hmm. I think that would be my advice overall. I mean, a good buy is still a good buy, right? Like there's, there, you can make right. money in a good market. You can make money in a bad market too, but that's, that's my, my advice for someone that you know, maybe doesn't have a huge financial moat, but you know, put it, put pen to paper and feel really, confident and have enough conviction that you want to hold on to this thing for three years you might not need to yeah. and you might be able to upgrade sooner but that's that's how i would look at it and and that's localized too i mean that's that advice may change in different parts of the country there's some some parts of the country that's appreciating really fast and then there's some other places where i think land values are going to be flat or, or up up a couple points or possibly down a couple points but mm -hmm. it's uh it's dynamic yeah, I assume most of your listeners are, you know, are probably in the Midwest, and and um, I mean, to me, the Midwest feels feels healthy, and um, I mean, just tillable land, wooded land, um, you know, it's just it's still the, you know, I, for example, like we're not terribly far from Columbus, Ohio, where we're buying in Ohio, and Columbus, Ohio is just boomtown, like you know, a hundred acres right around Columbus is going to cost you a fortune, and you know, but we're another hour out. So like when, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying That's we're going to become a suburb of Col Columbus. That's not what I'm saying, but it's going to affect the towns. You know, some of the towns around Columbus are actually pretty impoverished still, you know, when those towns, you know, rebound. So I, I'm very much looking, you know, I don't like to be lab like labeled as somebody who flips stuff because I'm only flipping, you know, a hunting farm to buy a bigger hunting farm and, I am I am in the the long term you know buy and hold game, largely you know in 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 Midwest states, mm -hmm. and I still believe that buying something at five six seven grand an acre. I don't know what what is it by you? Probably more like ten plus an acre. <laughs> no, not I mean it depends on the size and everything, but I would say your average recreational piece. Well, I just looked at a report here not too long ago, and so in twenty twenty two, the average recreational price. So that's a, a blended average of maybe a little bit of tillable or pure timber tracks. The average was 5,500 an acre. That was the blended mm -hmm. average. And, you know, you go to one county or one township, it's going to vary. But that's yeah. that's the blended average. And I think you make a really good point about Columbus growing. And I think everyone listening can think of the the metro area, whatever's closest to them. As Columbus continues to grow, right, and more money goes into it, more infrastructure gets in place, that piece sets an hour ish or two hours away from columbus mm -hmm. that that buyer pool of recreational ground is going to grow and therefore it's going to yeah. appreciate and that is exactly what happened so that first farm that first i think i bought little little pieces before this but if i can say about my first farm so to speak was that 77 acre piece and it was 45 minutes from so i'm in i'm in a town called sparta which is just north of grand rapids um you know, I bought, uh, and Grand Rapids is boomtown too. I mean, it's just always growing high ratings on 
places to live or affordability to live on Forbes or whatever. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's we're very West Michigan's probably the most successful part of of Michigan. And um, with that piece, forty five minutes away. I mean, I could tell the appreciation on paper for what things said was like fifteen percent. I mean, I experienced like you know insanely above that so that's where you get that that specific to a market i think i bought it for about 77 acres for two hundred and twenty thousand. i parceled off 17 acres and got uh this is gonna be hard for me to remember the exact numbers i think i parceled off 17 acres and got yeah i got one hundred and twenty thousand for the 17 acres and then the remaining 60 acres this is like a year and a half ish later i think i got to 280,000 for that remaining um, thing. So I think invest around 220 didn't do a lot of improvement, just kind of split it up how it should have probably been split up. And and yeah, somewhere, I mean, obviously you got closing costs, uh, um, a lot of closing and holding costs in there, but um, to go from really from, yeah, 220 to like 400 in a matter of like a year and a half. I mean, what, you know, just your, your, that's all again that's a large i would say that's like largely appreciation and a couple of the right decisions of doing yeah. doing the survey and the split and um and having the road frontage to you know to do that um and buying it right but i mean that was you know that was not an off market deal that was a that was an on market um deal so we and i that's- believe that, i believe we had that one under contract within like I think we had it verbally under contract within like eight hours of it hitting the market. So right, it, well, there's, um, there's two, that was what made that one special, probably. Yeah, two two good, well, a couple good points. Number one, the good deals go fast, so don't sit on your heels. And when you see a good deal, jump on it. Like it's it's it can be that simple. Now, obviously, there's a lot of prep work to know what is a good deal and what's an okay deal and and everything in between. And then uh, another thing that you brought up, and I'm probably gonna draw a blank now because I lost my <laughs> I lost my second thought here. Um, Oh, you mentioned this isn't it, but just in general, uh, uh, Warren Buffett has a quote, and I'm going to botch it, but he talks about like there's a guy, or maybe it was Charlie Munger, but talking about like those who think they can time the market and then those who just know you can't time the market. And I think that mm-hmm. that is very, very, very important because if if you and I could have timed the market, uh, that would dictate all of our decisions. But it, it would, yeah. I mean, I, I would, yeah. I tried to, I mean, when crypto, when was, Crypto, I feel like became a really big thing. What, like, I don't know, seven years ago, something mm-hmm. like that. Like it was making waves. I mean, I put like, I made a little bit of money in it and then I put a good chunk of change at it and pretty much lost it all. Um, you know, it, it's just, and that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to time, time all these, all this fake, you know, I'm not saying all crypto is fake, but the, the bull runs that these things, that these things were making were, were fake and they were inflated. Um, and I wasn't the big player in the game to, uh, you know, dictate what those, you know, what those things were. So, yeah, I mean, that's why I love buy and hold. I mean, you know, I, I wish I could keep every house we flip, you know, I, I, I can't, that's our, that's how we produce dollars to buy stuff to hold, um, you know, but I love, I love holding real estate more than I I think I love purchasing. I love buying real estate more than I like, uh, more than I like selling it. So, but it it will be interesting to, you know, I mean, like I said, I started investing in 2009 every year has gone up, you know, from that, from that point, it's either been flat. I mean, there there hardly has been a flat year. It's hardly been a year that it didn't go up at least eight to 10%. So our generation has not weathered the storm of a major market pullback. So that's, you know, that's, it's like you, you can build all these things. What does it look like? you know, we have to answer those questions of how do we prepare for um, that market pullback. So, so it's been fun to grow, but, you know, I think there's the, there's the, how do we grow? And then how do we preserve, um, you know, plan as yeah. well. So, and that's where we're looking at. Yeah. What is that, you know, what is that highest debt to income or the highest uh, debt to value, you know, range that I, you know, that we're comfortable in type things you have to answer those questions yeah those are really important i have uh this early next week i have a conversation scheduled with uh, a father and son and the father um 
lost he went bankrupt in the 80s farm crisis bought 600 acres farm 600 okay. acres went absolutely bankrupt and then and wow. then ended up buying some more stuff so i've been wanting to get someone like that on this podcast so bad because to your point we like you and i we haven't experienced a, a catastrophic downturn but but he did so i'll be i'll be very curious to, to talk with him and then a couple other points uh, that came back to me one of them i think is really important you mentioned about 60 percent of the farms you guys have bought have been listed and I, I think some people think like all the good deals are because of this, that, and the other, and and I don't have the network to get something like that, or I'm not lucky enough to do that. But over half of them, anyone listening could have found it and could have bought mm -hmm. it. I mean, I, to mm -hmm. me, that that should feel a little empowering to everyone listening. Like, hey, here's a yeah. guy that has done a lot of deals and over half of them have been listed to the public on the internet. Anyone in the world could have bought it. Yeah. I mean, identify that area. You know, I mean, I, you know, I keep pointing to Southeast Ohio now, you know, now everybody's going to come by in Southeast Ohio and Everyone, inflate the values, which is good, sure which is good. Better. Let me Appreciate pick up a few more parcels and then you guys can all come. So, um, <laughs> I think identify, you know, I think from a hunting farm standpoint, it kind of goes back to the question you asked of, you know, time of tips on buying that. I would almost say how, how far out am I willing to drive for a hunting, you know, farm, the day trip thing? I mean, is it the day trip thing? Do I want to do the day trip thing inside of, you know, whatever, an hour and a half? Do I want to do the six to seven hour thing? Um, I mean, I would love to go to Kansas. I would love, you know, Kansas has always been a dream of mine. I'm, I'm just not going to, you know, it, it just doesn't, the whole like hours, one full hours. day drive just doesn't make sense. So that's why you've seen me kind of, I mean, Illinois is probably the only like state I have not hit for, like within the the sphere of, uh, of Michigan here. So, um, you know, but I think just identify, identify what you want to do. If you're willing to do the six hour thing, um, you know, go, you know, go see like this. Okay. Go, let's just go back to that $70,000 piece, 35 acres. This piece has, uh, had a house. It's got power to a pole. It's got, um, it's got water. Um, it's got, so, so I bought a piece that i mean we just demo the trailer you can pull your camper you know you can go buy a ten thousand dollar camper and for 80 grand you've got for really a ten thousand dollar down payment and your five thousand dollar five to ten thousand dollar camper you have a beautiful deer camp and we killed three deer none of, none of them are giants but we killed three deer on there and the 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 165 inch deer that was on there did you know he got away so like and, and he'll you know he we got pictures of him late so he should be you know there should be 180 inch deer on there this this year maybe um or bigger so you know that's that's that piece was on market for ninety nine thousand. so you'll probably hate me as an agent for saying this but don't be afraid to lowball <laughs> don't be afraid to lowball some things either um don't just look at a farm see where it's priced and uh you know so i always do both things i like to i probably like to hit properties on like the day they're listed and be really aggressive, get my offer in right away, negotiate hard right away. Um, be very, when you know something's a deal, be very aggressive, be willing to, you know, go over ask and wave. I mean, again, we're in the house flipping, but we're very quick to wave in all inspections. Um, you know, we just kind of underwrite, okay, what are all the potential expenses if that could hit us? Um, you know, so be aggressive on those good deals, but you know, those pieces that have been on market 30, 60 days that have some hair on the deal like just go you know go lowball them and um and i think finding an agent you know finding an agent who's willing like who calls you back very quickly aggressively hits that that on market deal and being willing to work with an agent who's not willing to who doesn't care if they're like right some offensive offers offensively low offers or who can feel navigate that path really well mm -hmm. um you know those are valuable things to have so that's probably the two like on market strategies that we've we've taken like right now we're buying a piece in in ohio that is a house i think it's a house in 70 acres um you know and we find we've got the math figured out on what's the house on five acres worth and so just an agent that's competent of of map and agents are highly motivated to do that because they're getting multiple listings out of out of it um there's there's agents that we work with that we do a ton of business i mean they you know to the point where they could probably you know probably get an income of, an annual income of, of like just off our business so you you'll you do a couple deals with an agent and you'll get 
a highly motivated friend who's, you know, who's really advocating for you. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. One other question I had uh, to kind of wrap things up. Are you 1031 in a lot of these farms or do you do a blend or does it depend? Uh, what's, what's your strategy behind that? Yeah. You know, we, to date, we've only sold like five or six actual farms. And I think we've only, I don't think we, we have, I have only done like three or four 1031s in my life. And usually that's been, um, commercial to commercial um, or residential to commercial, something like that. One of my favorite things to do with land is to, um, you know, you want to check with your CPA on how to handle this as tax basis. But if I buy a farm and let's say I sell the more valuable half um, and, you know, after improving and, I'm hesitant to sell that last chunk or that last half of land, so to speak, because that's when the big taxable gain is going to hit me. So again, you have to, you have to like talk to your CPA. Don't rely on my tax advice, but you're able to, if you keep part of the land, you're able to structure a deal pretty in your tax favor. Um, again, there's some, there's some gray lines or some legal, not legal things of how to do that. But uh, you, you know, you buy, you buy 50 acres, you sell 30 of it. So some guys don't like hanging on to 20, you know, it's either dream farm or nothing for me. Again, I'm just, I'm quantity. I'd rather have, you know, a handful of spots um, to hunt. If I could buy five acres in Southeast Ohio, uh, that's probably a better hunting spot than anywhere where I'm going to hunt 50 you know, around my hometown right. here. So yeah. I probably have a higher likelihood of shooting a big deer, you know, there. Um, and even if it's on a bait pile, I mean, here, you, there's no baiting in Michigan. Um, and whereas there you can, I think you can dump a dump truck of corn if you <laughs> wanted to. So, um, so, you know, yeah, that's, um, on that, on that. So I, I guess I've been hesitant. I would probably have done more 1031s if I hadn't kept parts of parcels. Sure. Um, so to speak. So I, I highly value a 1031. They're affordable to do. I've usually been able to find the property and either identify the property as I go to sell the one. Um, so I, I, again, I think I've done like three or four 1031s, um, and, and it is an important, you know, component of dodging taxes legally. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's, uh, that call it, it's crazy of how complex 1031s can be. Uh, it's, I mean, there's, there's specialists. That's all they do is 1031s and yeah. go, go schedule. Where, where we, them. Where we've dodged taxes more, so to speak, has been on buying commercial buildings and doing the cost segregation studies, mm -hmm. um, which I believe was 80% last year and 100% like the years the years previous. I think there's a tax bill in Congress right now to pass that again at 100%. So, um, and more or less, yeah, what that is, is just taking, you know, advancing the depreciation so you're able to take that huge expense that first year. Mm -hmm. um, and myself as a real estate professional can take, take that full, or that's how I'm taxed. So I can take that full, uh, that full amount. So, so we're, we're more likely to buy a commercial building, do a cost segregation study. And that actually offsets the taxable gain on like flipping a land yeah. parcel. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> that's for that, for that year, you know, and then, so then next year we try to do the same thing again. Yeah. I, I try to not pay taxes in a, yeah, no, no, in one a legal likes way. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really interesting strategy that I know has not been covered here on the podcast. So I, I, definitely... that's what, that's why I like to blend. You know, I never would be all, all land again, yeah. like land. I, I wish, you know, I wish corn and bean prices would go through the roof and I wish, I wish, uh, yeah, I wish farming, you know, I, some days I wish I could be a farmer. Like I was think that's uh, I have no farming background. I'm sure I'd be <laughs> terrible at it, but, uh, I love the concept of farming and land producing food and, and, um, you know, so when, you know, I don't know when corn and beef, you know, goes through the rough and those things would make land more, you know, more valuable. Um, but in, you know, I, that's where, that's where commercial, commercial real estate, residential real estate just has these, you know, everything's fairly, you know, not perfectly predictable, but you know, we can, we can produce an income, you know, off of, off of those things. And then, and then play that, play that tax game. That's hard to play with just buying, mm -hmm. buying land. So. Yeah. 
Well, no, that's that's really exciting. Give me a call when you want to get in Illinois and, and finish the Midwest, uh, t- tie all the states yeah. together. Um, but if um, any anything else you want to share, and then we'll wrap it up. I uh, I don't think so. I appreciate uh, a lot of the. I've learned some things off of your uh, off your podcast, and just appreciate the uh, the opportunity to to do this. And um, you asked some great great questions, and I think always be evaluating those you know the business and and the purchases and i um yeah i'm just i love land and excited to excited to buy more of it you know concerned and excited for what what the future might uh hold over these next few years on land so i love it well um usually i give people the opportunity to share contact information you're welcome to do that if you don't want to that's fine too or or maybe someone has a dilapidated house in michigan they want to sell so (laughs) it's up to you (laughs) yeah we don't have i mean yeah we don't have you know much of a need for marketing agents usually do most of that for us our business is fairly you know in the background and and agents are are marketing for uh sales and buy but if you want to reach out to me it's just my name at gmail.com so just calvin beaky at at gmail.com so awesome well thank you so much calvin i really appreciate it learned a lot have a page of notes and uh thanks for coming on here thanks jake